Hello and welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, June 15th, 2023, we are pleased to present Transatlantic Debate, Evaluating the EU-US Data Privacy Framework. Uh, my name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After the, after the discussion, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you do have a question at any point during the program, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and then we'll handle those as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, I'll introduce our moderator for today's program. Today, we are moderated by Matthew Hyman, who is General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Waystar Health. He's also the chair of the Federal Society's International and National Security Practice Group. With that, thank you all for being with us. Matthew, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, I'm delighted to moderate this conversation today because we have two genuine experts to talk about today's topic, and I'm going to make very brief introductions of them, uh, and I'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, Stuart Baker is our, our first speaker. Um, Stuart practices law with the Steptoe & Johnson firm in Washington, D.C., Stuart has had significant experience in the public sector as a senior member of uh, a couple of administrations. He was an assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security during President George W. Bush's administration. Before that, he was the GC at the National Security Agency. Uh, and Stuart's practice, as, as those posts would suggest, focuses on national security topics, cybersecurity, technology issues. He's also the host of the Cyber Law Podcast. So Stuart, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. And then our second speaker, we're delighted to have Max Schrems. Uh, Max is an activist, lawyer, and author um, whose uh, campaigns have focused on privacy issues uh, in Europe, particularly focused on uh, uh, infringements by companies like Facebook. Um, and he's been um, very active with litigation before EU tribunals and courts. Um, and in addition to that, he's the founder of the None of Your Business uh, nonprofit organization that focuses on privacy issues. He's based in Vienna, Austria. And Max, we're delighted to have you. Thanks a lot. Great. Well, why don't we jump right in? Um, this topic can in some respects be, I think, overwhelming for someone that's not an expert in the space. Um, and given that our audience likely in, uh, includes non-experts that are trying to learn, there's a long history of uh, what I'll call data negotiations between the EU and the United States. And if we go through the history of it, it began with something called Safe Harbor, then it became Privacy Shield, and, and the latest version is referred to as the framework. I'm just wondering if maybe, Max, we could start with you and then Stuart, I'll ask you to comment too. Could you just sort of walk us through the evolution of this um, sort of, I'll call it a dialogue or discussion that's been going on between the EU and the US for approximately the last 25 years? Um, yeah, I mean, in a very short um, version, um, the EU member states had data protection laws ever since the 70s, but they were very inconsistent. So in the 90s, the European Union issued a data protection directive. So that is a law by the EU that has to be implemented into national law. Um, part of that was that there's going to be a free flow of data within the EU member states to like foster the common market and, and not have any boundaries on, on data transfers anymore. But that also meant that basically there was an expert prohibition on personal data. So any data that relates to an individual. Um, and obviously there needs kind of to be some flexibility for data transfers. Um, so there is options if it's really necessary to transfer data abroad. So if you send an email abroad or you need to book a hotel abroad or something like that, that's already built into the law as an exemption. Um, and then there is an option for a kind of outsourcing situation. So when you really just you know, feel it's more practical, cheaper, whatever, to process your data abroad. And these are either done with a so-called adequacy decision. So it means that another country kind of has the same law as Europe. Um, typical example would be Switzerland. They basically have the same data protection law as the EU. So we basically recognize each other as being equal, and then there is no problem with data transfers. And then the other option is kind of contractual systems. So we're basically a uh, um, entity in a third country, 
in simple terms, signs a contract saying contractually, I'm going to follow EU law when I process data, it, it, even though there is no national data uh, protection law in my country necessarily. Um, now, that's kind of the overall situation. The U.S. was kind of in that second bucket because there is no omnibus privacy law in the U.S., um, but there was very intense pressure already in the to th end of the 90s to have a special deal, so to say, that was safe harbor. Um, I was 13 years old when that thing was passed, and already then some university professor said, ah, there are some questions if this is really so adequate and, and works so well. Um, what then happened is that Snowden came out with the disclosures over especially FISA 702, um, and that was the first time we looked at the surveillance laws in the U.S. a little bit closer, and then it kind of turned out that there's very little protection for non-U.S. citizens. Um, and that led to the litigation. We had the first time around at the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice is kind of the Supreme Court of the European Union. And they invalidated that deal, saying that it would violate the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is kind of the European version of a Bill of Rights. And there is an Article 6 and 7 for privacy and data protection and 47 for um, access to courts. Um, and they basically said it violated all of these. Um, that led to a second deal, which was hammered out between the European Commission, which is kind of the executive part of the Euro European Union, and the US government that was called Privacy Shield. Now, sounds like a new deal, but it was basically, most of the text was literally the same. They just copied it over, put a new text on it, changed little parts within the within the um, actual text of the situation, but, but didn't really do more than that. What's important, oftentimes, all of this is called a deal or a negotiation or an agreement. In reality, what it is, is an executive decision by the European Union. They can declare another country to be adequate. It's not a bilateral international treaty or anything like that. So it's a one-sided situation that kind of, in, in real terms, is, is, is hammered out between the two countries um, and is a kind of get back and forth, but it's not a legal instrument between the two countries. It's one country recognizing the other one. Um, and that was struck down a second time around, not overly surprisingly, because there was not a big difference um, to the situation before. Then we had one and a half years now where the European Union negotiators said there is really no option for a new deal because the US is not moving all too much. That usually comes out of the situation that the law in the US is very hard to change. They usually try to work with executive orders. I don't have to explain to the audience over there why that is. Um, and then there was a meeting between Biden and von der Leyen and all the stuff that the lawyers haven't figured out for one and a half years, these two guys figured out in five minutes. And suddenly we had a new deal and that is this new framework. And that is based on the idea of putting an executive order there that limits kind of the surveillance in the US. So basically the idea is FISA 702 allows more, but the executive order would limit it a bit. Um, and the idea is that that would be enough to kind of convince the Court of Justice on the European side that such a deal would, would um, be able to, to go forward. Um, one thing that's a bit dropped there usually is that the executive order, the new one, is very similar to PPD 28, which is the old Obama executive order. Um, and I think on the European side, there is not too much comparison between the two because PPD 28 was already before the Court of Justice and they have analyzed that and then said it's not enough. And now it's a bit kind of what politics tries to do is to say, oh, there is an exec executive order with limitations. They're all great. Instead of saying, what is the delta? What is the difference between the old one and the new one? And how much did it go forward? So um, my short kind of summary of the new deal, of the new executive order is, it's a bit like that the Court of Justice on the European side asked for a proper fence, and now we're talking about a fence that's like, you know, an inch higher than the one before. <laughs> but we're, I, I'm very much um, questioning if, if that is going to convince the judges after all. Um, that's, I hope, a somewhat fair and accurate summary of, of what happened, even though that's, I think, 25 years of litigation that I tried to summarize here. Yeah, no, congratulations to you, Max, for trying to summarize 25 years of litigation in about eight minutes. It's, it's it, I know it's, it, there's a lot more detail and I appreciate sort of the, you hitting the headlines. And Stuart, I, I'd welcome your thoughts on sort of the how we got here and then we can get into the details of what, what's in front of us now, which is obviously the framework. Right. Uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll start even further back. <clears throat> I actually lived through parts of this and, and negotiated over the adequacy of uh, U.S. law with respect to um, uh, passenger name records. Uh, I, so I've, I've been in the trenches on this uh, and have followed it since the beginning. I, I do think it's worth stepping back and thinking a little bit about what a remarkable thing it is for Europeans to say, if you want to have our data, 
we have to decide that your law is adequate. Um, you know, there is a whiff of colonialism in any determination by a European state that somebody else's law is adequate. And it provokes um, at a minimum some resentment and some jokes. Uh, when I negotiated these deals and we got a successful outcome, uh, I gave the entire team um, uh, underwear that had on the front a little stamp that said uh, a European Union certified adequate. Uh, which was a way of um, mocking the European Union's notion that they should sit in judgment on the adequacy of laws of the rest of the world. Uh, it is nonetheless, and the, the, the justification it is, as Max said, uh, we're sending our data someplace and we will no longer have control of it. We want to make sure that it is treated with appropriate respect and protection for the people whose data is involved here. Um, and so it, it's a, a, an accom it's possible to reach an accommodation, but I do think that one of the real concerns at, uh, throughout this exercise has been a failure in Europe to recognize that they are um, they are acting in a fashion that is um, highly judgmental about uh, uh, other people's laws and that they ought to be cautious about saying we know better than you what your law should be. Uh, and that is uh, that theme goes through most of the, the problems that the U.S. has had with Europe and particularly with the Court of Justice. What happened, in my view, with respect to uh, data protection uh, and exports is this was originally a provision designed by the Euro European Commission to make sure that when commercial data was exported, the rules that governed how it could be used commercially would remain the same, more or less, and that you couldn't ship it to a, a data haven and then start spamming everybody whose address you had gotten in Germany. Uh, but there's no clear distinction about the adequacy of the law between the adequacy of the private law that governs private parties and the adequacy of the public law that governs government access to the data. And so, uh, as Max said, with the uh, Snowden leaks, suddenly there was enormous concern about what U.S. intelligence could do with data and an effort to use the adequacy provisions to uh, discipline U.S. intelligence. And indeed, the European Court of Justice was so eager to respond to the Snowden uh, uh, revelations that they accused the United States of being inadequate on the basis of a Guardian article about how law, U.S. law worked that was wrong. They've never corrected that, as far as I know. They were just, they just had to we, reach this to, issue. To, to add to that, we had even like um, a representative from the U.S. that um, I think was under the Obama administration that had this top secure contained as, I think we had witnesses all over the place and six weeks of hearings in Ireland on all the facts of U.S. law. So it was and not yet, a yet, article yet, and I can correct that and, for sure. <laughs> and, and the, yet the court got it wrong. They, they got it wrong and they cited the Guardian article. So I, it, I, I, I think that tells you that there was a, uh, a determination to reach this issue uh, on the European Court of Justice. Uh, the second thing I, I, I think is worth saying about this that frames the whole thing is that the European Court of Justice sitting in Luxembourg uh, has construed uh, the uh, treaty uh, that formed the European Union, the uh, Charter of Rights, in a fashion that doesn't apply to anybody except the United States. They, they have made up a bunch of rules and they have made up these rules for how to do intelligence uh, in, the, in a, the complete absence of practical experience. And they almost bragged that none of these rules would apply to European governments because they didn't have the competence to address them. Um, and they did not 
borrow from existing laws where people had actually asked the question, can we make this work as a practical matter? And that, uh, that, that, that enthusiasm for making up rules, I, it's, a, it's a kind of... Uh, if, I, if I may, because yep, it, it gets a bit much. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I, 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 go for these it. These rules are not made up. That's the Charter of Fundamental Rights under Article 6 and 7, where all the member states have agreed it's part of like the constitutional fabric of the EU. It's not like the Bill of Rights wasn't made up by someone. It's literally there. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, 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 can just, I, can I stop just, you there? Because I, 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 I agree and, and, with no, you. One, that, one, one short second okay. uh, part. Um, we did have a lot of litigation about um, surveillance in Europe as well. Typical thing is data retention, uh, which is a bit like the 215 programs in the US, where the Court of Justice also found them to be unconstitutional or against the treaties in EU law. So um, that is not only on the US. There is probably 10 to 20 cases in similar fashion about the European Union, the European member states. So um, the, uh, in very limited uh, uh, circumstances, that is true, although it is a fact that the Court, the, the countries of Europe have in many cases said, European Court of Justice, you do not know what you're talking about. We're not going to apply your data retention rule. I think the, the German court said that. Uh, uh, France has gotten its Conseil d'État to uh, come to the same conclusion. There is the, the the European Court of Justice has aggressively interpreted the framework, uh, 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 the, the Charter of Rights. And, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that most of the things that they are relying on, they they have said essentially two things about uh, uh, the latest, uh, about the deal with the United States. We think you need a law, and and Max is saying that means a law passed by Congress, I believe, uh, uh, that sets out all of the restrictions on uh, uh, your uh, uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, And we think you need to be able to send people to a court to get redress, to get particular uh, 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 rights recognized determinations about whether your rights were violated. I, the Some of the arguments that we're going to hear here are when the um, court says you need a law, do you, it, it raises the question, do you need a statute passed by a particular legislature? Or can you use the whole bundle of ways in which Courts or uh, jurisdictions make law, executive orders, regulations, and the like. Um, I think if you look at the um, the framework, the agreement, uh, uh, the, the the charter, uh, it the, of the European Union, it provides that you have to have a framework. It does not require that all of it be statutory law, and so the court, to the extent the court is going to say, no, I want a written law, it's going beyond what the words That's not, of I think the that was never the discussion, to be honest. Um, okay. That is a sidestep, and, and there is a differentiation. And um, to be honest, it's always a bit hard because the court of justice and the whole system, how the EU set, set up is, I know, a bit foreign to the US <laughs> lawyers. So I tried to kind of interpret, uh, explain a couple of these things. So the charter does require that any limitation um, of a fundamental right is set out by law. Now, law is has its own meaning in EU law that's different than what law means in Austrian law or German law. Um, any EU law is always interpreted only in the light of EU law. Now, we do know, have um, common law jurisdictions like Ireland or it used to be UK, um, Malta, uh, Cyprus, that do have common law as well. So that is also considered law from, from that perspective. However, the more you kind of, um, the more you interfere with a fundamental right, the more the law has to be precise and accurate. The biggest problem currently with the executive orders is that they do not uh, generate third party rights. So basically, if someone violates that, there is no court right now that I can rely on and say you violated section 351 of that executive order. And now I have a case to go against the NSA in that specific court. I, I think redress I, I, came, I, came out of the discussion so far. I, I think I think redress is is an, is going to be an important part of the discussion. Yeah. I just wanted to understand you don't really think that that it matters too much whether this is an executive order or a law by the uh, uh, so Congress. If you, in abstract to any third country, um, so fundamentally. You can transfer data to other countries, and it's really a matter if another country is seen as adequate 
meaning essentially the same as the European Union. And that is something that the US wants to have. That is something that is not like, you know, a handout or something. And there's not a lot of countries that have that. So if that is the path that the US government wants, we have to go through the different steps that are simply required in the law. Well, I just, I, I asked you one question. Legal, is it, yeah, yeah. Is it, is, if, if there's a statute, does it have to be a statute uh, uh, or does uh, it have to be an executive order? There. Now the law has to deal with the situation in 190 jurisdictions in the world. It's not specific to the US. If you then take the US reality, um, an executive order would, I think in, in my personal view, work if it would confer third party rights, if it would be directly okay. Well, just like a normal statutory law. Now, my information, not the expert on US law here, is that right now, how an executive order is usually working is that it can limit the government in that situation, but it cannot go to the district court in DC and right. sue the NSA because they violated the section of executive order. I forgot. So the let's, 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 let's jump to, <laughs> and let's jump the, to the redress question. So we, do, we don't look at what is the name of it, but what is the quality of the legal instrument? Okay. And then you assess the quality of the legal instrument and that make your determination. If, so if what, you the, what, the, what this solution, what the, the U.S. has proposed is they say, we can give you a tribunal that is impartial and that is objective uh, and independent. Uh, it will not be the U.S. courts. We can't constitutionally um, provide access to the courts for claims that simply say there's been a violation. There has to be a much more concrete harm than that. That's US constitutional law. So we yeah. can't do that. Uh, uh, so we have created a two-step uh, process in which first your complaint is reviewed by the uh, civil liberties officer and then uh, by an independent court established by the justice department with guarantees of impartiality and objectivity. So the, uh, to my mind, it's pretty clear that nothing in the charter requires that all of these determinations of redress be made by courts. There's a lot of references to courts in the charter, and I don't see it referenced in the context. What they require, you're, you're, at, you're correct in that sense that the court, in the EU, there is something else than a court. So we usually operate under, or largely for a long time, have operated under the Charter of Fundamental uh, the Con uh, Convention, which is kind of a separate system that comes out of the uh, Council of Europe. Um, and there, what the word is that's used generally is a, is a tribunal. And the understanding is that a tribunal can be less than what in the US is considered a court. So you can, for example, have a judge that only sits for 10 years, not for a life tenure. There is a little bit more room to maneuver for a tribunal than for a court as we usually have it also under Austrian constitutional law. Now, the interesting part is um, that that tribunal still has to be effective and you have to have an effective procedure. Now, there are tribunals in the European Union that have that executive kind of situation where they're kind of embedded in the executive, but still are an independent kind of decision-making body, if I want to call it that way. Um, that could be a tribunal that could work to a certain extent. The problem that we have right now is largely the procedural steps. So um, if you want to raise something within your system, um, you need to know that you had a negative situation, whatever it is. Let's say you were denied a visa if you go to the US, so you were you know, put on the on the security list for the next flight. Now, as a citizen that is concerned about that situation, I have to prove to my local data protection authority in Europe, so each member state in the EU has a data protection authority, Germany has 17 because they're federal, <laughs> and, and I have to go to that authority, prove that this decision or that processing happened based on a data transfer of a specific company under a specific legal instrument after the new, after the new deal came into force, which is impossible in the first step to prove, or at least I have to make it likely. So that's already on the first level, and we tried it on an old deal that had the same requirements. Already the authorities in Europe rejected our claims because we couldn't really show that, for example, a rejection of a visa or you know being on the security list of flight was actually based on such data that was transferred under these instruments. So that's already the first step where in reality, you don't have access to it. If you, for whatever random reason, have all that information because someone, I don't know, put it, leaked it or something, there's really typically no other way that you get it because there is no information about um, surveillance. Usually there's no Freedom of Information Act that applies here. The government is very closed up about what it does there. So if in theory you have that, 
you basically go to the civil liberties um, officer and they will give you an answer that is literally spelled out in the executive order. They will tell you that they neither confirm nor deny that there was any surveillance. If there was surveillance, it was a, either legal or it was not legal. And if it was not legal, they remedied the situation. Isn't, isn't this answer, what, uh, it, it's, let me stop, let me stop you there. Second. This, this okay. answer is exactly blueprinted in the executive order. So you have a court system where you have the judgment before you even brought your case. And if no, you, you have, you have two it, choices, you have two choices. Mm. Uh, they, and and the facts, of course, could could produce different results. Uh, uh, so I, if you read I, it, I think it's, it's worth quote, uh, what they have uh, to answer. It's under quotation marks what this civil liberties officer has to answer. It, they yes. can, to my understanding, not deviate from that specific wording that they have to answer to you. Now, if you're unhappy about it, you can have an appeal. And because you're not going to know what happened in the procedure, you're not allowed to talk to them. You're not represented. You don't hear anything. You can write, I appeal, because that's all you're going to be able to do, where it goes to this tribunal or court, or however you want to call it in, in, in detail, and you will get literally the same answer a second time around, which is also in quotation marks in the executive order. Now, just for, for the sake of like shortcutting the whole discussion, the Court of Justice has to look at that on the European side and assess if that is... Um, a proper court and a proper court procedure under Article 47 of the Charter, which is the same article that they have to apply to Hungary, to Poland, to all the craziness that goes on there. And they would have to come to the conclusion that the appointment of judges in Poland is problematic under 47 and a violation of the fundamental rights, but this system is actually a perfect court system. That's going to be a very, very hard way to think, George. So, so let me let me stop you now, Max, because you, yeah. you've gone on uh, quite a ways with this. I, I think it's fair to, to take a step back and ask what we're talking about here. We mm. are talking about intelligence programs, uh, intelligence programs that are vital to the security of the United States and, frankly, much of Europe. Uh, and they have to be, you, you cannot just say, oh, let me tell you how it worked in your case. If Vladimir Putin takes advantage of this and says, my data has gone to the United States, I'd like to see what you have on me. We're going to say no, and there, no one will think that that's a good idea uh, uh, to provide him with that information. So to 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 construct a system that does intelligence under law without wrecking the intelligence part of it, and that's clearly important today, uh, we can't provide extensive information. And in fact, at some point, with any system that has classified information of this sort, you have to rely on the internal workings of the system after the complaint has been filed. And so there's going to be an investigation. There's going to be an objective determination by two um, uh, decision-making levels, and but they will not be able to provide a lot of data. This is exactly what the Germans do. This is exactly what the French do. They say, this is what the British have done. We can tell you that we looked at your uh, uh, question, we looked at it hard, and we've taken appropriate action where action was necessary. And that's all we can tell. Actually, in the United States, the U.S. has said it's going to appoint representatives to be amici to advance the interest of the uh, um, uh, party complaining, but it, they can't tell the party complaining all of the details of the intelligence. And that's, I think, all is the important word. Um, so that's all accepted on the EU law as well. We have the same issues with, you know, we also have wiretapping if there is a reason for it. Um, now, the interesting part is um, either you usually have ex ante, like before the event, any kind of judicial determination, if that's really, if there is a probable cause, for example. And that's the interesting part to, to also bridge our discussion a bit. The interesting thing is that 702, as it operates right now, is unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment for U.S. citizens. So we actually agree on both sides of the Atlantic that how 702 operates. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't agree. I'm, yeah. I'm on this side. So, <laughs> You could run 702 surveillance on, on a U.S. citizen without any problem, and you would never need to kind of go, because my understanding of 702 is very simple. It kind of divides U.S. Yes, data. It, it, so US you're, data. you're right that it, it, focuses, it, it requires that the target be non-American. Exactly. Because, because the, the legal rules that govern. would happen. <laughs> yes. I, 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 and, and your objection has been from time to time that you think that this is a more, uh, that in Europe, Everybody gets the benefit of these rules, although I didn't hear you rushing to Vladimir Putin's defense. Uh, uh, that so is absolutely maybe... accurate. We do have um, in the EU um, a system of human rights. That is true, and that is a historic situation. We also had 
basically citizens' rights up to the Second World War. Same thing in Austria. Our old constitutional rights are citizens' rights. Only citizens have the right to demonstrate in Austria. Foreigners wouldn't. Now, that was switched after the Second World War. We now have either the Charter or the Convention that have human rights. So any Russian is free to demonstrate on an Austrian street and has exactly that fundamental right, just like an Austrian does. But now, you, but you see how how you see how that makes it even more complicated to say exactly. human rights law requires access or correction or exactly. really any information about how the program is working. Exactly. Now, there's two parts. First of all, we have a human rights system, which I think most countries globally have moved towards the U.S., as you know, has a very old constitution that just has comes from another time in history. Um, but we could, so I think to kind of try to kind of find common denominators. What's interesting is that at least on my understanding on both sides of the Atlantic is that a surveillance system as it is right now in the, with 702, if done on your own citizens, would violate the Fourth Amendment. That's correct. That's correct. That's great to hear. Um, the same thing is true from a European perspective. If you apply 702 on a European citizen, you come to the same conclusion. So it's very hard for the Court of Justice to say, hey, there is unconstitutional surveillance in another country, but at the same time, we see it as adequate. Would be very hard for the U.S. to get away around as well, which we see with the Huawei discussion. Which, which, which is why the right. which is why the, the executive and, order and all of the other provisions exactly. that are special exactly. rights for Europeans. Exactly. Then it would be interesting if the executive order would get it to a level that, for example, would be compliant with the with the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. I would doubt it personally. I don't know if you have a different view. Um, but you see the problem here that if we have um, data transfers and if we send data across the globe, and that is fundamentally in the long run going to be the really interesting part, how do we get among democratic or Western countries where we have a globalized internet and we want to have data flows into a situation where we can have data go back and forth without worrying that once the data is outside of our borders, our citizens are under total surveillance. I, 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 run the I, really interesting part. Matthew, go yeah. ahead. I'd like to ask a question about that. And I'll start with Max and maybe Stuart, you could respond. So what you said, Max, I thought was interesting, which is data flows across national borders or outside the EU to other parts of the world. And I'm wondering, how do you think about data flow? So obviously the focus of this long running debate has been in a US EU focused discussion. I'm wondering how do you think about data flows that are going from the EU to non democratic <laughs> countries yeah. such as China? And I, just out of curiosity, I went on the NOYB website and I typed China into your search box and I didn't see any reference to China. And I'm just wondering how do you think about a company like ByteDance that has TikTok? And exactly. data That's first, from Europeans to China. Yeah. China. So the reality is we look at kind of apps and software that people use on, on a daily basis. And to be honest, ByteDance is the very first example where we ever had a data transfer to China. The reality is that 99% of the cases where you have data transfers is the US. That is the reason from a, you know, relevance perspective, the US is the one country that is really relevant. Um, now there's another differentiation. China has never asked the EU to be deemed adequate. They would probably, I mean, the, the commission would probably laugh off, laugh themselves off their chairs if, if, if China would come around and say, hey, we want to have a deal like the US too. So there is a differentiation here that first of all, we don't have but, the deal. But wait, 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 wait stop extent. you there, Max. And secondly, that, there is not an adequacy decision with China or Russia or the other examples that you that, 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 that just means it's far more illegal to be sending data to China than to the United States because the U.S. has at least gone through this process and it's is functioning under true. an adequacy rule. And, and so to true. say uh, to, uh, any data flows to China ought to be something that is of concern, especially to somebody who thinks that the Fourth Amendment ought to apply globally I, uh, to you. Why is it that you've never even bothered to raise this as a case? So because they factually, so again, you have to you have to understand how EU law works to get the, to to understand the answer. Maybe so, EU law works has uh, EU law has different situations for data transfers. There is a whole bunch of different options to transfer data. Now, if it's really necessary to transfer data, so I book a hotel in Beijing. That is always you don't think that's the data. only kinds of data transfers that are no, occurring. No, this uh, WeChat that you have moves to massive to, amounts of data. I have data. to be able to, you know, I have to give you the three or four examples. No, no, come on, that's uh, you're, you're <laughs> filibustering now. If you want to hear an answer, you need to wait a minute. Listen, Stuart, let's just 
Let him answer the question. <laughs> So really, so there are situations where it's really necessary to transfer data. That is possible with any country in the world, North Korea, if you want. That's fine. No one ever questions that. Then there is a second situation where you really have an adequacy determination of a country, which means that country is basically the same as the EU when it comes to privacy. That was always a steep argument for the US anyways, given that there is no omnibus privacy law, given the surveillance situation. But that's a separate stuff. That is the highest thing you can get. That's what the US wants which literally 10 countries out of, outside of the EU so far got. Um, and what's in the middle of it is these contractual arrangements, which you can use right now with the US where there's no adequacy decision currently, but you have to assess it versus the national um, law. And that is a situation why there's hardly any data transfers to China. I can tell you from my practice of five years of litigation, I came across a data transfer to China once with 800 cases once. But I can tell you in these 800 cases, I get a data transfer to the US in probably 700 of them. So the reality is, um, it's really not a, a broader issue. Are you saying, are you saying you're confident no that system. TikTok and WeChat and uh, Timu and Shine, every one of those com uh, co uh, companies is keeping all of this data out of China? No, that's exactly what I'm telling you. We have these situations, but they are hardly existent. When I turn on my Android phone, all my data goes in that moment to Google and to the US before I even installed any TikTok or whatsoever. So the reality is that from a European perspective, tra data transfers to the US are the vast bulk issue that we have. And, um, and, is, and, and, and let's, 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 let's automatically go into China whenever there is an international discussion. The first thing that comes up is China. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you I haven't, your old guy, you all you haven't published China, a, a, an investigation of on our phones. You, you, on our phones, we don't have Chinese apps in, in the bulk of it. There is TikTok. So, so you, you, this is the narcissism of small differences. You have a, a fight over whether this is exactly the right remedy for the uh, 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 that, that you would uh, uh, being offered by the United States. And maybe there should be more communication. And that's got to stop all the uh, uh, data flows to the United States. And then the massive human rights violations in China, which are undoubtedly aided by uh, data transfers. You say, well, I don't I don't see them. Uh, they're not, they're, they're not, they're, they're not top of mind for me. And no, you know, there's no Snowden who's, who's come forward to get our attention. I, 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 frankly, you should be ashamed of yourself. I don't know if that is um, the level that you want to have this conversation on, but um, I personally don't. Um, but if you want to have evidence and factual discussion, you can see that we factually don't have bulk data transfers to, the, to, to China, but we do have them to the US, that we do not have a discussion if there is an adequacy decision for China, that's absolutely off the table, but the US wants to have adequacy, and that is two very different sets of situations. If you want to conflate them to make your point, quite honestly, that's something I would be ashamed of. You could you could bring a lawsuit to, you could bring a lawsuit tomorrow in Austrian courts uh, uh, against data transfers to using WeChat or TikTok uh, uh, if you had a plaintiff but you you know you have to install the the apps um, and you haven't done it. So I work here for free. Um, we have a budget of one million euro a year and have ten lawyers. Um, I have a certain. I have to make conscious decisions of what we do or not. And if something is a niche issue. We're not going to litigate it. If it becomes a larger issue, we will. And I'm the first one to go after it because a Chinese adequacy decision, which is not existent, you're talking about something that simply doesn't exist, would be the easiest thing to shoot down ever. But it simply does not exist. We do not have an adequacy decision with China. This is not getting okay. us anywhere. Time out. Right. Time out. I want to ask one other question before we turn it over to our audience uh, for feedback. And that is, Max, could you um, could you help us to better understand what appears to be, and Stuart mentioned it in his comments, and I think you've noted it too uh, in your work, this sort of dichotomy that exists between uh, the European Court of Justice's view on data privacy issues and whether or not the U.S. system is adequate or not to protect um, European uh, citizens' rights versus how European nation states go about this work and think about these issues. And I'm just wondering if you've got a, a perspective on that you could share with us. Yeah, that's actually quite an interesting topic. And there is a hypocrisy in the EU law at that specific point. Now, um, as it was with the US Constitution, 
100 years ago, and you guys probably know better than me, um, that did not apply to the states, as far as I'm informed. Um, that gradually then was expanded that, that these uh, rights would also apply to the states like the Fourth Amendment or whatever. We do have a very similar situation in the EU treaties that the EU member states, when they signed the treaties to join the EU, exempt what they call national security from EU law, and that is national security of the member states. Now, there is a discussion of how far that goes. If, for example, that is only what, for example, the German secret services do internally, or that would also, for example, include if the German secret services ask a private entity to provide them data to. There is a good argument to say the private entity already falls under EU law and you would have to apply the things. Um, national security is also very narrow. It's really about the statehood and kind of the statehood being, you know, imploding. For example, criminal situations, like as I mentioned before, data retention is under EU law. And there is case law on that where the Court of Justice said you can. Now, that is a really interesting part, especially if you look at Brexit, that the UK actually for their national security that were exempt from EU law from that provision. But once they left the EU, automatically it's not the national security of a member state anymore. It's then a third country, and that provision doesn't apply anymore. So we're in a very interesting situation that we can have litigation about third countries uh, before the Court of Justice, but not about the own member state's national security, uh, which is just the reality of how the treaties are, are written. So, so let me, uh, let, 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 let effort, me address obviously. that, too. It's, it, I, one I, last I, sentence. What fills in here is that at least the convention, which is the Strasbourg Court, still applies. But what's really interesting from a legal perspective is that the Luxembourg Court, so the EU Court, has a very high standard for privacy, while Strasbourg, the, kind of convention, uh, the, the, um, the convention court, has a very, very low standard. They pretty much permitted almost any mass surveillance. And that is really interesting because it plays out exactly at this little point, especially for Germany, France, and Sweden, which are the only three countries in the EU that really have vaster surveillance knowledge or, or capabilities. So I, 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 Austria, I, the, I, I think I think that's I think that's exactly the problem yes. that the court sitting in uh Luxembourg, the Court of Justice, uh doesn't have authority and is proud of not having authority to set rules for anybody except people who come before it in with litigation that uh, NOYB has chosen to bring up against their uh, adequacy uh, determination. Um, and the, the place I would start here is when you're trying to regulate surveillance for national security purposes, you are on very dangerous ground. Of course, it's important to regulate it, but it's also important not to lose your capabilities, uh, not to expose those capabilities. Um, and people, uh, countries go through experiences as they try to find the right balance between protection and control of surveillance, uh, protection of rights and control of surveillance. <clears throat> and they they learn by doing, uh, uh, by their experiences. We learned a lot, uh, and it was very painful uh, at 9-11 when we had thought that it was a great idea to have a wall between law enforcement and intelligence, and it cost us 3,000 lives. Uh, and that was a disaster that means that that principle, which otherwise kind of sounds pretty good if you were sitting in Luxembourg, it would sound like a good idea, uh, will never be acceptable to the US. Most countries have been through this. They have arrived at more or less the same place. And if you look at the OECD, which brought together 39 democracies to talk about what the limits on surveillance ought to be, they came up with limits that are very different from what the court uh, it, it has proposed, the, the court in Luxembourg has proposed, uh, and very different from what Max Schrems is proposing. But they are all saying, yes, you, you, your, your legal regime is going to be your legal regime, but as long as it's basically similar to others, we can live with it. And they have acknowledged that you can't give people full redress with correction uh, in the context of uh, a, uh, a national security decision. So I, I, it seems to me that the problem here is not that the uh, Luxembourg court is um, the, the good 
court that's holding firm, but that everybody disagrees with them. And then honest, and everybody I, has I, bailed out except us. Because I don't know who everybody is, is in this case. Well, I, I, how gonna, about Germany? How about how about France? How about how OECD about the European 39 countries? That, how about I'm gonna, the European Parliament that passed all these laws with 90 percent majority, um, including I'm, all the conservatives and so on? So uh, it's, it's much more nuanced and differential, to be honest, than everybody on one side, but the Court of Justice. Oh, to well, be I appreciate the back and forth and the rigorous, uh, the vigorous discussion. Um, we've got a couple of questions from our audience um, that I'd like to put to our our panelists. Um, we've got two questions that I think I can sort of combine into one. One audience member is asking, is it possible to achieve adequacy, meaning U.S. adequacy, um, without a federal U.S. privacy law? Is there anything the U.S. government can do to achieve an arrangement um, that would hold up at the ECJ. And then another person asked, which I think these are interwoven questions, what do Max and Stewart's perfect US-EU data transfer arrangements look like? Presumably there's some common ground around the desirability of data sharing between being easier between democratic countries that are governed by the rule of law, which I think there's really no debate. <laughs> the US and EU nation states are democrat countries and they're governed by the rule of law. And so is there a is there a common ground that makes sense for all to live under, notwithstanding, you know, sort of the, the debate we've had today? And I'll, maybe I'll start with Max, if you could give a brief answer. And then Stuart, if you could give a brief answer, because there's yeah. maybe one more question. we uh, I'll try my best to be brief. So I think on yeah. the federal privacy law, that's not an issue, because basically, if there's a vacuum for the commercial sector, that is something you can fill with a contractual situation. That is kind of what Privacy Shield and Safe Harbor did. And to be honest, we were at the Court of Justice and also supported all these parts that work. Like we were really in the middle ground in this litigation, which as a privacy activist, you hardly are in. Um, the part where it really gets tricky without any legal change, to my understanding of the US structure, is um, the 702 surveillance part. And there I'm leading over to like the perfect solution. I think if among democratic countries, we come to certain standards, we kind of go along the, for example, probable cause system where you have a judicial approval before into before data is actually tapped into. That is a typical situation where you say, okay, that is something we can all agree on. Or if it's thereafter, because also to kind of uh, rebut a bit the idea of you have to have everything transparent, usually that is also a proportionality principle in the EU. So you say, okay, is 20 years later on a minor thing, is it really impossible to tell people what happened? Um, or is it in that specific situation where you have an ongoing threat, really not possible to say it, which is fair in that moment. And there we need probably a bit more than this black and white situation that's discussed right now to get to solution from the court of justice perspective will probably pass. I hope that's useful as an answer. Yeah, Stuart, thoughts about uh, common ground? Yeah, I, I agree with Max that uh, the there's a lot of discussion in the US about how we need a privacy law and that'll solve the problem. It won't. Uh, we have solved the problem of regulating private companies that move the data for at least for adequacy purposes. So this is just a debate about uh, whether the um, restrictions that the US has proposed and the remedies the US has proposed are adequate. I do think, Max, I should say, I, I think you really overstated the uh, uh, notion that you have to go in and prove that your rights were violated in a particular way in order to get a data protection authority to act, at least under the U.S. proposal. You just have to say, I think my rights were violated. Uh, and that is enough to trigger the review, at least in the U.S. If you had problems with your data protection authorities, I think that's a problem of the adequacy of European law. That part, just to be accurate on who can actually go to the DPA, is part of the deal from the U.S. side. That's part of the executive order. It's not part of U.S. EU law. In EU law, I never have a problem to because we don't have Article Three standing in the U.S. But, anyway. but, but no one's no, no one says that even exist. <laughs> no one no one says the Data Protection Authority has to find a violation or has they to have, have a to detailed. Be able to, so you cannot communicate directly to the civil liberties um, person. I forgot the exact name. Um, you have to go to your national data protection authority. They can then raise it with the U.S. authorities. So as an individual citizen in the EU, you cannot directly communicate. You have to go through the DPA. And the DPA has to certain certain elements for the U.S. to accept that reference. Um, and they are set out in the executive order. This is not EU law that is part of the executive order. 
that the EU authority has to comply with to be even able to kind of use that remedy. But they only have to say there is a credible allegation of a violation. They don't have to say exactly. uh, And how you got to come up with a credible violation? uh, You can. You can. If if if, If you simply didn't get your visa or you were put on the security list. I was put on a security list a couple of times on flights. You just get your 4S on your boarding pass and you have no clue whatsoever and your airline doesn't have any clue why that happened. And then you have to prove that that somehow happened under one of the data transfers. I think it's you have to make an allegation. I've done it. I've done. Per- I've personally done this submission and got rejected. Well, so you got rejected <laughs> by your data protection authority, right? Exactly. Back okay, so uh, look, I, 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 I can't, solve your data protection authority problems, even though you seem to want to solve all of mine. I, and I, I, I think that's uh, that objection is an objection based in the adequacy of data protection law in uh, it's, uh, again, uh, Europe. It's really hard to have a conversation if it's not fact-based. This is part of the executive order. I bet you a million euros. Yes, of course, the, the data protection is authority. part of the executive order is yeah, not but... EU law. But you know, if you, if you just try to generate some hate against EU law, be my guest. It's just not very accurate of what you're doing here. No, no, I, but I think you're you're trying to blame the U.S. for the I'm, decisions I'm of your the data protection authority. I'm, I'm just basically telling you the realities of this system and why it's not working. If you don't want to hear the answer to it, that's fair. But then we may want to move on to the next one. Well, I think that's, the system is not working the way you would like it. I, I think we can agree. But uh, uh, to say there's an inadequacy in saying we would like to hear from somebody who actually has a, a position of responsibility that this is an allegation worth reviewing is not an unreasonable thing. Let's move on. There's a, another question in the in the Q&A section. Um, and Stuart, this one's directed to you. And it says, why doesn't the U.S. take a similar approach to China, I assume, as the EU is taking to the U.S., and simply not negotiate or request permission for, from the EU? It seems like the EU wants to hold the U.S. to a higher standard than even some of its EU member states. This is true. And, and, and I think the reason the US has um, worked so hard to find common ground here is because um, the consequences for a lot of US companies and a lot of European companies as well um, would be disastrous if there actually were an effort to cut off um, a, a exports of data. Uh, there's just an enormous flow of data across uh, the, the Atlantic. And if Europe were to say that can't happen and we're going to impose billion dollar penalties for moving that data, it would be uh, disastrous for the economy. Yeah. Uh, and so the U.S. kind of is being a little bit blackmailed into accepting these restrictions, uh, notwithstanding that they are not the same restrictions that apply to European governments. Um, so that's that's essentially why we're here and why we keep coming back. But yes, if 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 the court tells us to do something that violates our constitution, as I suspect Max is trying to get us to do, um, uh, then we're probably not going to do it. And then uh, there will be a crisis and we'll have to uh, um, take the Chinese approach, I suspect. And just Max, um, just coming off of that response from Stuart, I'm wondering, and I'm just looking for some common ground here. Would you agree with at least the statement that if if the EU and the US are unable to broker an accord on this issue, that it would be highly detrimental to European businesses as well as US businesses. I assume you agree. Um, yeah, I think that's a both um that's a problem on both sides. Uh what we do see with US businesses is that they largely host data in Europe by now anyways, for technical reasons, latency and so on, that usually you can already choose that your data is hosted in Frankfurt in somewhere in Scandinavia, oftentimes because it's colder. Um, that already exists. The bigger issue that we have right now for these companies or for these situations is that they still have service access from the US to have a 24 hour service um, situation. So one company that I talked to, they say they have 12 hours in Dublin, 12 hours in California, and they can basically access stuff all over the globe. Now, if you would cut that access, that would already for a lot of the processing enable companies, American companies to provide that data in Europe and can be able to credibly say, that they would not have possession, custody, or control of that data. That is what Microsoft did in Germany. They basically outsourced the data holding to a German company saying, we still provide the software, we still you know, sell the product, but we actually don't have access to the user data anymore. And that way we can tell 
the NSA that we don't have a possibility there. What I found interesting is that the question before in China wasn't really answered in the other way around, because we do have the same discussion with who or why not being able to um, you know, provide our network services for 5G in the US, in Canada, in Europe just as well, for exactly the same concerns. And it's interesting because when it comes to these discussions, the US has a very similar view than Europe, that they say, okay, if we cannot guarantee that these technical elements are actually not spying on us. We not allowed, we don't allow them on our market, which is you know, the most normal thing to do as a nation state. And it's just interesting that there is on the other side, a kind of a very different view if Europe does that. And the situation well, is uh, could, could I stop you there? very much yeah. that there is a dependency that is very different that we Max, do have let, most services. Let me, let me, let me stop you on the, right on the, the US. Max, let me stop you on the point of uh, the U.S. has similar rules. It, 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 they're not exactly the same, but they certainly have the same concern about uh, espionage. Uh, um, and they have restricted what kinds of data may be, uh, what kinds of equipment may be used in 5G networks. Uh, but the equipment that they allow to be used all comes from Scandinavia. It uh, it, it is Nokia it is uh, Ericsson equipment because the U.S. has recognized that uh, Finland and uh, Sweden are broadly aligned with the United States in terms of um, uh, their approach to democracy and uh, surveillance. Uh, what's unusual is this demand by Europe that uh, the U.S., adopt every single thing that the European Court of Justice wants. It's not every like it, it's not every single thing. The, 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 the charter is the baseline of fundamental rights. That's the minimum standard. Um, and that is what it simply will require from any international treaty. You can enable it any other international treaty under that. And I'm sure you can do that under U.S. law as well. If you found some international agreement or law that you know, for whatever reason violates the Bill of Rights, you have the same situation that actually any judge in the U.S. can so, declare that law unlawful. And that is simply the setting that we're operating in. We're not going to change that to, to comfort the executive order. One very short thing, um, what's super interesting is the new executive order, by the way, does exactly the same thing. It will only come into force if the EU grants the same rights to American citizens, which makes sense. But is it kind of a copy of the exact part that you criticized on the European side right now? Well, is we learned something. The executive order as well. <laughs> let, me, let me ask one last question because we got an interesting one. It's obviously timely given um, all of the flurry of activity around AI. And someone's asking a question around probably asking you all to look in your respective crystal balls and um, comment on. How do these how do how will data privacy laws affect large language models? Um, and the, the question is put this way: if I file a complaint in my home country that my Reddit user data was used to train a large language model, and LMs don't store my personal data, but rather the statistical interrelations, would that imply that my data was used to train a commercial model that has no way of removing my data? And, and then he says. So if there's a single complaint around this large language model, would that require the shutting down of that LLM so that that piece of information can be stripped out of that large language model? I'm just yeah, wondering so if, if, Max, you've given thought to sort of the intersection between data privacy laws and the way it works today and, and how LLMs work. Two, um, two things at the beginning. The GDPR itself, the European privacy law, applies to personal data, and it's kind of a raw data law. It tells you if you can use data or not data, but, but or not, but not how you use it. So if you use it with an AI or like the most old-fashioned algorithm you could find, is not really regulated in the law. The European Union just passes an AI Act right now. It's just at the making that will deal with these things specifically, but that's not law yet. Um, for your question specifically, if the data is personal, which means you can trace it back to that individual person, which in a statistical model, you usually can't. But right. let's assume for the sake of the question that you can really figure out that Max Schrems is interested in, I don't know, this thing online, and you can actually get it back to that individual person. You're that interested in purchasing Sturt Baker's book. Exactly. Um, if that is in, in the data, then um, you would have, that would be considered personal data. Um, and you would need a legal basis for that. There are six legal bases in the GDPR. 
what usually everybody knows is consent. There are five others. What they would claim usually is legitimate interest to say that they needed that for training it. And currently there is no case law on that, how far legitimate interest in that sphere goes. Usually legitimate interest is more defensive in the sense of security, for example, CCTV cameras, all of that is accepted. If it's more for making money, more or less, legitimate interest is very limited. So that could be interesting. The other thing that may come in is there is exemptions under national law for research. And a lot of this kind of stuff could fall into the whole research bucket. Um, and that's the point where as a lawyer, you would have to say, I need to kind of need more facts and details to actually yeah. give you a final answer. But that's kind of the elements of where you would be in. If that yeah. part is really illegal, you could shut down the whole thing. Yes. We've, we're just about time. Stuart, comment, just a quick comment on the intersection between data privacy law and, um, you know, AI and LLMs. I think that uh, um, it is true that uh, uh, training a, la a large ling language model is processing data. If there's personal data in there, you're processing that personal data. I, I think it would be very difficult, uh, not impossible, uh, but difficult to survive um, a challenge to having processed personal data for purposes of training a large language model that will be used in a wide variety of ways, even if you can't get the data back out. Um, and then raises the question, can you fix that by saying, oh, okay, I did not mean to include Max Schrems data. I'll take it out. No, I don't think you can. I think as a practical matter, it would be impossible to, uh, um, uh, fix that problem once the training has occurred. So GDPR probably raises serious questions about the legitimacy of every large language model. All right, well, we are at time. I thank both Stuart Baker and Max Schrems for a vigorous, energetic, and informative discussion. And um, I will put an invitation out there, Max, Stuart, we'd love to have you come back again at some point um, to discuss this, because I know even in 61 minutes, we barely scratched the surface of this debate and these issues. But uh, I thank you both for joining us. Thank you. It was great. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, thank you, Matthew. Uh, just on behalf of the Federal Society, I wanted to say thanks to Max for joining us all the way from Vienna uh, and for sharing his time with us um, as always, we do welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. Please keep an eye on our website and your emails as well for any announcements about upcoming webinars and live events. With that, thanks again, and we are adjourned.